Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. Hey, Engagers, welcome to this special anniversary episode, because yes, this is the two-year anniversary episode for Professor Game podcast we started in 2017 in November and now it's been over two years since the day that Monday 6th of November in which we started where the first episode was published along with episode 000, episode 001 with Yu Kai Chow and episode 002 with Scott Renke. So this is a celebration episode and also a very special one, a very different one because Today, we won't have any interviews as, as it happened last year. We did something different. And again, you know, I wanted to change things up as well for this year. And this time, instead of going for an interview, I am going to walk you through what I see is a process for gamification, a general process. This is, has been what I've gathered from my personal experience, experience from my guests, from all my travel, all the conferences I've been both speaking and listening to very deeply, and of course, my personal experience as well. All the things that I've gone through, the workshops, all the courses I've done on gamification, game design, game thinking, and, and related. So this is a bit of a gathering of that experience. Of course, this is a podcast, so remember, there is no visual material to accompany what we're the, the way we're listening. So the idea is that this will be a bit introductory. And of course, if you want to know a bit more, if you're interested in having, you know, a, a workshop, a talk or anything else, you all you have to do is contact me and we can figure out the details of how that would look like. Uh, again, if you want to see more, um, currently what I will have is a web page where you can request different things and you will see some things about the workshops I've done and the workshops that are, are possible. All you have to do is go to professorgame.com slash process. And there you'll find, you know, information about what we are doing today. And of course, you can see the show notes of this episode in Professor Game. You just type in the search bar, you type anniversary and you will find anniversary one, anniversary two. And if you're listening to this in the future, hopefully you will also be listening or seeing anniversary three, four, five and beyond. So... Let's get to this. And and the way I structure this, this has also been from my experience delivering workshops. So I'll structure this in a similar manner, at least in the order of things and the types of things I'll be talking about. Of course, the practical side, you know, of going through some of these steps and actually implementing them is not going to happen directly. I, I won't be able to be there today uh, or right now with you. But of course, this could be happening in the future. And of course, the idea is that you go through these things, you build something and, you know, you have your first experience or you have your second experience in there. You start building upon that for a future of gamification career, if that's what you want, or to implement some gamification project for your company, for the company you're working at, whatever it is that you're thinking about, even for your personal life. So that's what awaits you today in this episode. And I want to start very briefly, because even though, you know, gamification has been going around for a while, uh, let's say maybe around 10 years as a term, it hasn't been really formally, so to speak, defined. There are, there are things that you can find, you know, a formal definition that everybody agrees upon. Gamification is not one of those things for good or for bad. So what I'm going to do very quickly is talk you through three definitions that I always use as a reference then go through what I, th I see and what I use, what is my working definition of gamification to this date, uh, you know, today in November in 2019, what is the definition I'm using in my regular work? And then we'll go through the steps that I've been talking about and we'll get into some details, some examples, and we'll run through that. So the first one is from, and it's probably the most quoted one, it's from Professor Sebastian de Terding. And it's what he defines gamification is as the use of game design elements in non-game contexts. Very powerful, very straightforward as well. Using things from game design or elements from game design 
in contexts that are not a game in itself. So there are the ups and downs to that definition for the first one of them. Again, it's a very good definition, but one of the things that you some people might not completely agree with is by saying that games are explicitly excluded from the definition of gamification. And not everybody would, would agree with that. So again, that is the definition that Sebastian delivered. It's again, probably one of the most quoted ones, and that's why I wanted to, to use it and as well to, to put it up first, because it's probably one of the oldest ones. And Sebastian has been doing as well fantastic work. Then uh, our first guest in Professor Game, Yukai Chow, for episode 001. So you can find him in professorgame.com slash podcast slash 001. Or, of course, typing Yukai Chow in the search bar, you'll find his episode, the first episode of the podcast, the first guest in the podcast. Definitely a guru in the in the gamification world, somebody who's been referenced in many different ways, who has a book, who has a whole process, has the Octalis. There's there's many things around Yukai Chao and he's doing amazing work out there with his consultancy as well. And there's many things going on. So Yukai's definition, completely different from Sebastian's, but of course it is all completely related in a way. So he says that gamification is the craft of deriving all the fun and addicting elements found in games and applying them to real world or productive activities. Wow, super powerful. So one of the things that I, that I when I, every time I, I read this definition from Yukai is that I, it seems to me that it comes especially from his experience when he was playing this game for all so long and then his friends started leaving the game and he had all this experience points, so to speak, in that game, all this knowledge, all these items. And then, of course, once everybody started leaving, the purpose of being in the game became completely different and he felt like he could have invested that time into something productive. And that's where, for him, in my understanding, and Yukai might correct me in the future if, it, if this is wrong, that's where this kind of definition comes from. You know, all that fun and what he says about addicting elements found in games and applying them to real world and that, that word productive activities there is, is one of the keys to this that I'm mentioning. And then we have Andrzej Marczewski. Andrzej Marczewski says the use, also a past guest, if you type his name, Andrzej or Marczewski, his last name, it's Polish, like my second last name as well. It's not going to be an easy one, uh, but you can find it there if you type the hex ad, for example, it's going to come up in his episode. He says that it is the use of game design, game elements, and play for non-entertainment purposes. And this is probably, the, I left it last because it's the most similar to the definition I use. Andrzej, again, is another guru. He has his blog, gamified.uk, that's been going on for for a very long time as a lot of exciting work going on there so i would suggest you as well to to check that out as well as the work by sebastian deterting yukai chow anjay all of the guests in professor game has have done probably some fantastic work and what is my definition and this is to put you in the context into what i'll be discussing further my working definition is the use of game design and game el game elements and play for purposes beyond entertainment. And that's the small change that I introduced from Sebastian's and Andrzej Merchewski's because I think there could be entertainment involved or not be, but I wouldn't like to exclude it. I wouldn't like to exclude necessarily directly games because again, I think that definitions have to be inclusive in the, in the sense that more people are able to agree with that. But that, again, that's a definition I'm using today in November in 2019. It might change in, in some time, but that's the working definition and it's worked pretty well for me. And the first question, of course, we like to answer is, why do we want to use gamification? And, you know, there's many situations in which gamification is useful. There's other ones in which it might not be. There's great examples. Anjay in a conference was talking about a situation, a very specific one in which, you know, the solution was not to use gamification, but rather to change the wording of, a, of an ad in which they were looking for employees. And that actually changed the whole situation and they found the employee that they were looking for. Just by changing the words, not necessarily necessarily through gamification. This is something that happens and in in, in it can happen in everyday life. Sometimes it can be an overshoot to go for gamification. But again, that's why we go through a process like the one that we're going to be talking about. And what does this process look like? The first step and, or the first challenge, as I like to, to phrase it when I'm doing this in, in workshops, is to find the true objective. So what, what do I mean by saying the true objective? Sometimes when you're starting to delve into gamification, you find something that might be very superficial. Because in the end, uh, you, you solve what that looks like and the client or you yourself are not completely satisfied by that solution. And it is because the actual 
problem that you were trying to solve was went a lot deeper. There were several layers that you had to go through to find that very specific objective that you were targeting with gamification. So what I mean by that is, and one of the strategies that is used is using the, what they call the five whys. So, you know, you say, well, this is my objective. And then you say, well, why is that my an objective? Why is that even important for me or for the company or for the client or for the classroom? That's where you have to start asking why. And you ask why once, so you come up to something that is a bit deeper and you ask why once again until, and, and it could be five times, that's why it's called the five whys, or it could be a bit more, maybe one less. But I would suggest you to go at least through five whys to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the objective. It's When it's with the clients, it's not very easy because not everybody will be easily convinced that their objective is not that one. But, you know, using many different ways in which you you know very subtly can talk to people and explain why this is important you have to go deeper and as deep as you can the deeper is actually the better and finding that objective is very very important because if you don't define your objective very very clearly then you won't know if you are actually achieving your objective with your solution so don't forget about the importance of defining your objective very, very clearly, crystal clear, and also in a way that you're able to measure whether or not you have success. So again, define your objective very, very clearly. Once it is very, very clearly defined, you have to make sure that you go on to the next step. And this might be in a single meeting. This might take 10 minutes, one hour, two hours. It's going to depend on how deep and how complex the system that you need to build or how complex the actual problem might be. Here, it's very important, as I mentioned before, about the measurability to go deep. I mean, to go deep. For example, if it's behavior you want to change, you want to go as, and this I heard for the first time from Michael Wu, you want to go as granular with that behavior as you can. Michael Wu was also a, a past guest. And what do you mean by that? Is as specific of a behavior that you want. You want for people to do this, then that, then that, and then that, this other thing. The more specific you are, the easier it'll be for you to clarify what the solution to that problem looks like. So very, very important. Find the true objectives. If one of them could be behavior change, you know, you go for that uh, very, very specifically. And the next, uh, the next step or the next challenge that I, I, I always use, and I think, and again, this has been throughout the experience, I think this is very generalizable in a way from seeing what different guests have been doing, what my experience looks like. I, I see that most people go for the objective, which is fundamental. And the next thing that you have to do is define your players. There's, there's two approaches to this, and this depends very much on what you're going to, you're looking towards building. The example that I'm going to use here, the first one is an app that I heard from the first time from Near Eyal when this app is called FitBot. So Fit, like Fit Body, but without the Y. So FitBot, a single word. So this app was built, of course, they had a very clear objective. They wanted to get people who are frustrated with the gym to, you know, to go to the gym and have something to do when they arrive there. But it was not just for everybody. This is not for the person who who is super difficult to convince or who will probably never go to the gym. This is not for, for that kind of person. It's not either for that person who's been going to the gym and knows exactly what to do when they arrive there. They've been going for years. They're probably even a trainer by now or could train other people. This app is not for those people. This app is for those people who have, you know, the willingness to go to the gym, who actually go to the gym. But once they arrive there, they're frustrated because they don't know what to do next or they get bored by whatever dynamic was established by them because they do it once, twice, maybe three times, and then they say, oh, come on, I don't want to do this over again. So that is for that very, very specific type of people. And what I mean by this is one of the approaches is if you're building an app and you're using gamification for it, here you might be defining the players that you want to attract. And that's a very different approach from something which could be, for example, a company needs a solution and the solution is for their employees. Those employees are there. You're not defining who are the employees that you're targeting. You're actually given a population in which you have to target. Or you have a classroom. When you have a classroom, you are, you know, you, you're handed over a group of students, of participants that you have to target. And what you're looking for there is to engage these students or these employees into doing whatever it is that your objectives have defined. defined. 
On the other hand, the example that I was giving you was from Fitbot. There you are actually sort of creating a market opportunity. You're creating something that wasn't necessarily there. You're, you're sort of attacking the problem of a segment that didn't have a solution for that problem. So it's two different approaches, but with the same objective. You have to understand your players as best as possible. And for the first one, of course, you want to understand what are their problems, what do you, you know, what are their motivations, what are their habits. And for the second group, which is the one that you are sort of handed uh, over, you don't de- decide who these people are going to be. Usually, one of the things that that tends happen to happen is that you have different profiles of people, and you have to target each and every one of those, or at least most of them. And a very useful tool that I've seen being used many, many times, and it has also been validated academically is Andrzej Marczewski's player types. So you can reference that. Uh, you can definitely go to his, his blog and look for the player types. You can see what they, are, what they are there. You can even see a test that you can take to see what type of player you tend to be. And, and this changes depending on the environment. But the, the very interesting thing as well is that Andrzej has used these players to also say, well, these types of players or the players that behave this way in these types of environments are motivated by, and he goes on and lists different game mechanics or different things that might be motivating these types of of different players. So that could be very useful for the further steps that we will take. But again, defining them very well, understanding them, going beyond the demographics. It's not just, you know, age, um, you know, geographic location, where are they from, what's their culture. Those are very important. Those are basic. But the, the key word here is that they are basic. They are the basis for you to build upon an understanding of who your players actually are. What are they motivated by? What are their habits? What are they doing right now? What you know things do they like to do? What other things? If it's, for example, employees, you would very much like to know, for example, what could be or at least in general, it could be the, 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 the favorite sport of, of these employees. That could be very useful because maybe the theme will be built upon what you see is a common thread throughout any employees. And an important thing here and, and a clarification, you are always going to try to go for every single person that you have in that organization or, or everybody in that demographic that you defined, if it's like in the example of Fitbot. But the truth of, of the matter is that 100%, I would say that's almost, if not absolutely impossible, it's very, very close to being impossible. So don't feel frustrated if there are some people who are not being motivated or are not, or are not being engaged by your solution. Again, whether that's your employees, whether that's in your classroom, in your university, or in your school, whatever it is your population you're targeting, there is a massive chance that not absolutely everybody is going to be engaged. And that is okay. Because what you're trying to to, to do is get them from the situation where you are currently, where people are not really very engaged, or maybe 10%, 20% are engaged, to taking it to 80%, 90%, 95%, 99%, whatever that percentage is, you're going to have people in a much better situation. The question always is, I mean, if if there is not a problem, if your engagement is, is, is great, then you don't need a solution. You know, your engagement is great. You probably have other types of problems you have to deal with. But if engagement is your problem, then increasing the engagement or the motivation towards the activities or the learning that you want people to get, that is the objective. And again, if not every single person is motivated by that, you know, don't be frustrated. That's okay. That's normal. And that's simply the way it goes. So again, we went through... Challenge number one, which is defining very well what your objectives are. Now we are in challenge number two, which is define your players. And we had two separate ways of seeing it. One is, you know, sort of defining your own demographic or your own group of players that you're going to target. And that's when you're creating something new, some a, a solution or an app. You're an entrepreneur, for example, and you're looking for that, you know, that market, that blue ocean that you're looking for. And the other one is when you're sort of handed, you know, your the customers, the clients that you're targeting, the employees of that company, your, your, your learners in your classroom, your students in your classroom, and you define them as players because you're creating a gamification solution. All right. You have those two. And the idea is that whichever is the one that is your situation, you define them very well so that you move on to the next challenge. And the next challenge, of course, now you know what you want to achieve. You know who you are going to achieve that with. And the next one is to start what I would call challenge number three, which is brainstorming your solution. And here I would say go for the the, the, the sort of the classic uh, concept of brainstorming in the sense that you are 
not qualifying any of the ideas that you might have as stupid. Open up your creativity as much as you can. There will be a time for selecting, but that time is not challenge number three. The idea here is that you come up with every smart, not so smart, and stupid idea that you might have, you and or your team, you come up with every single one of those ideas. You have an inventory of all those ideas, of all those game mechanics, of all those ways of motivating the people that you're looking towards motivating, and you have a huge umbrella of open amounts of things that you're you're trying, your you know, ideas that came up. If you feel that you're kind of stuck, there's many creativity, you know, sort of ways of approaching this. One that I found pretty useful is, you, you know, saying, how could I spend an infinite amount of money in sol- solving this problem? So go for that ridiculous solution that you know you will never be doing because it costs so much money that it doesn't make any sense or so much time that it's almost impossible. Try to build a solution in that like order and then you kind of get that out of your head or maybe it says, ah, but this could be, you know, instead of spending one gajillion dollars in this, I could spend, you know, $10 in something that could do something very similar in a simpler way and do it very quickly. So again, get things out of your head, write them down. Don't be ashamed of whatever it is. If you don't want anybody to read it, nobody has to read that. It's only maybe even just for you. But don't forget what the objective here is. Okay, the objective here is to get as many ideas as possible. So again, open up your mind, have everything, have that inventory of a lot of ideas, game design ideas. And one thing that I've also used here are Anne Coppins, also a past guest from the, uh, the podcast, her gamification card deck. Because there, there's, there's a sort of a structured process that you can use there. Very useful. I use these, at least currently, I use them in my own workshops. I use them for people to come up with ideas of the way they arrange their minds. A part of those decks, I'm always using them currently in my workshop. So that's that's a very good idea if, you, if you're uh, able to get access to those cards. I would very highly suggest it or any other cards that you think are equivalent or that you can have access to. I think those are very good methods of coming up with solutions. And again, as many solutions, the more solutions, the better. The next step, of course, and as I probably advanced you already, is getting that inventory and saying, okay, I had all this huge amount of ideas. What am I going to keep from these? And quick (laughs) disclaimer, don't throw the rest into the trash. Keep them somewhere because they might come in handy in the future. So here here are the ideas that you select from all of these solutions that you have, all these possibilities. You sit down and you say, well, what is the one, two, three, four, maybe five things that I can grab from this and say, I can build a solution with these five things. And here, when I say build a solution, because challenge number four is building your solution, When I say build, the idea here is that it is as minimal as possible in the sense that what you want here, at least the first time you do it, is a prototype. And we'll be talking about that and what the importance of that is because, well, we'll we'll be talking about that later. But again, the idea is that you gather all this huge amount of ideas that you got, you select a few and you say, okay, this is what I'm going to run with. And again, at least for now, remember that you are testing the waters in a way we are making a huge amount of assumptions here about who are our demographics, what are their motivations, what are the things that we think they will be you know, engaging with, and we're not always going to be right. So here, the idea is to build something, a prototype, as easy as possible. And, and I like to bring here the example of, again, I'm cut, jumping back again to Anne Coppins, her hexagon. I will put a reference to that in the show notes and everything else I've been mentioning. But her hexagon, a very cool thing about that is that it was a solution. That the problem was related to cybersecurity, and she solved it with a board game. So again, open your mind to things that could be digital, non-digital, like board games, card games, you know, Dungeons and Dragons types of, of, of games, so role-playing games. There's many, many possibilities to solving your problem. So open up your mind to all those things. But here again, even if your solution is going to be digital, I would invite you to initially, at least the first round, build something that is, you know, based on paper. So that you can, and that will be the next step, so you can actually play test it. And the, the thing that you will see here is that many of those assumptions, or at least some of those assumptions, will be wrong. So that the idea is that when you realize that some of those ideas are wrong, it's easier for you both emotionally and physically to build or rebuild your solution with some changes 
so that you're actually building upon something better. So again, don't try to build a final product in the first time because that is a very good recipe for going to failure and, and, and massive failure. And the bigger the failure, the harder it'll be to get out of it and the more costly in terms of maybe money, maybe time, and or even emotional investment that you might have in it. So again here, the idea is that you build a small prototype, something that you can just play around with and then so that you move it on towards the next step, which I call the first boss fight. The first boss fight here is play testing. So the idea here is you build this very simple solution and you go out and find somebody that could be or the, the most likely person to be in your audience that you can find. And even if you don't can't find anybody or you say, well, this is a very, very rough solution, it's even better to you know approach your family and friends and show them what you have, get them to play a little bit with, with, with it and do that play testing and so that you can see how they react to your initial solution. Again, take it with a pinch of salt because maybe your friends and family, if that's what you went for, are not going to be your final target audience and some things might not be the same. But study and, and try to see and observe what are their reactions? What do they understand? What do they not understand? Are they motivated by it? How they, do they interact with your solution? Try to see this with a scientist mind. And if you are you know, in the academic world and you can see it as much as an academic as you can, like from the outside, you have all these hypotheses and you're testing your hypotheses that's the best approach that you can do. And a, a very typical temptation here is to go in and explain everything and to say, you know, oh, you're doing this wrong or do this here, do this there. Try to be as hands off. The more hands off you can be with that solution, the better. I mean, there might be some things that since it's a very rough prototype, you might be, need some minimal explanations, but let the people do whatever it is that they're doing. Don't be tempted to jump in and explain things because maybe that's actually going to skew your a little bit your your experiment. And after playtesting the if if you've been into playtesting, if you've seen these types of things and, and 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 you've worked with prototypes, the almost obvious next step is of course iteration because you have to iterate. It's the the what I call the next step is getting better or iteration. And why is this very, very important? Because typically, again, the first time, maybe the second, the third, and even the fourth time, or even more, you will have some assumptions which you're doing. You're assuming things. You're believing that this is your this is the way your audience thinks. You think that these things are going to motivate them, and you will commit mistakes. There are things that you will be able to improve throughout time, and the best way to do it is by testing. So you do the play testing. You learn something. You do something new, and you iterate. What does that mean? You're going to go back to one of your challenges. Maybe you have to start almost from scratch and start with a new objective because whatever you had defined was not reaching what you wanted or you realized in the in the middle of the process that, you know, that's not the actual objective. There's a deeper layer I can go to and that probably is going to change the solution as well. Or you can say, look, I define my players this way, but they're not really like that. I, I have more insights now, so I'm going to define them better. I'm going to use all this insight I got from my playtesting, and I'm going to incorporate it. And of course, once you change your players, probably some of the solutions that you brainstormed are going to change, or you're going to have new ones, or you're going to, the, the ones that you had from your brainstorming, you're going to switch some of the ones that you used in your prototype, take some away, put in some new, and there, or you can jump directly into that step to do the changes that might be necessary. So very, very important that you go through this iteration step at the very bare minimum once or twice. Because you, again, you will commit mistakes. I mean, time permitting, the more that you can do this iteration, or even once you have your solution out there, if you can continue to iterate and improve whatever your solution is, that is the ideal place to be at. So don't forget about iteration. And I'm going to do a very quick recap of what we've mentioned. We have all these challenges that we will be facing. The first one is understanding your true objectives. Then challenge number two is about all about your players. So understanding who your players are or even defining them depending on what uh, situation you're in. Then of course comes the challenge of doing challenge number three of doing your brainstorming and getting all those ideas outside of your mind and on paper or on a digital format, whatever you work with and works better for you. The challenge number four is actually building your prototype or your final solution, depending on where you are in, on iteration, you build something with all those ideas that you've, you've had or all that feedback that you've gathered. The next step, 
definitely is to go for the playtesting. Don't go and jump all in without playtesting. Don't go and jump all in with that solution if you don't know how your audience is going to react or at least have the nearest idea that you can for that playtesting. And of course, after playtesting, you have to iterate. Again, at least once, maybe, I mean, ideally at least, at the very least twice, but if you don't iterate at least once, the chances that you're going to get things wrong are super, super high. So again, thank you very much for joining me as well in this episode of Professor Game, this anniversary, this celebrational episode for the second anniversary of Professor Game, where I wanted to, you know, give you a bit more into my world, into the way that I've been seeing gamification, because typically we're talking about what the guests are seeing, and I wanted to give you some of the insights into my process. Of course, it's definitely not going to be perfect. I am constantly iterating and playtesting with this process as well. Uh, if you don't like this process, what I invite you is to test whatever process you want to test, mine or any of the, you know, over 100 guests that we've had in the past. Because as you remember, in every single episode, this is a question I make to our guests. What is your process? What does it look like? Try something, implement it, see what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Try it out. Try gamification out. If you have already tried it out and you have failed, try something else. No problem with that. That's the normal thing. That's the only way in which we can learn. How do children learn how to walk? By falling over and over and over again. And that's the only way that I would argue we would actually have a sustainable and awesome and incredible solution or way of doing things is by learning, by failing. And that's something that, at least in my in my case, I tell my students very much, is that if you don't fail, if you don't you know try things and, and not get it right the first time, you're probably not going to have such a, a deep learning as you could have as you were, if you were failing. Maybe it's because you already knew and there you were not learning too much. But usually you have to try some things and understand th- things either in your brain or directly in your final solution. So again, thank you very much for joining us for these two years. Or even if you're joining us today for the first time, I'm very happy to have you here in Gagers. This podcast only makes sense, and I've said this many times, only makes sense with you. So please continue to listen to this. Give me feedback. I'm constantly playtesting and providing feedback both on this process, on the podcast itself. If you haven't already, subscribe and rate us on whatever app you're listening to this uh, podcast on. Subscribe to our email list. There you can be in direct contact with me. You can see new opportunities. All you have to do is go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, put your name, your email, then you're going to get a confirmation email and we will be in direct contact. I'm, I'm, I'm not a spammer. Maybe in this anniversary month, I will be spending spending a little bit more time on email, sending you information and, and all about what we've been doing. But typically I am, you know, not very, I try to be not very invasive of, of your emails. And the other thing, if you're interested in in this general process, want to know more about this process that I have right now, you can go to professorgame.com slash process. You'll find there some of the things that I'm doing, some of the possibilities that I'm currently offering. And right now, as of November, that could be something like workshops or going to talk to your organization or your university or your school, whatever that is. And we can, you know, have that opportunity or it could be something else. In the future, I'm sure I'll be, again, playtesting and iterating and this will be changing and evolving hopefully to offer a solution that is always meaningful for every one of you in the engagers that wants to go through with this. So again, thank you very much. However, for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. <laughs>